Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Is this a good volume? Right. Uh, yeah, so as I uh, just said, I'm, I'm Alex Maxovics. Uh, I'm here to talk about sort of holy wells and whales. And uh, just to uh, quickly point out what I mean by holy wells, this is one example. This is near St. David's at the end of Pembrokeshire. This is St. Nong's well, which is the, the mother uh, of St. David, the patron saint of Wales. Um, there are many examples of similar architecture. This is Bishop's Well in Brecon, or near Brecon. Uh, now, they don't all look this fantastic. <laughs> uh, you'll see some other examples, but this is kind of you know, your archetypal uh, perfect well. Um, my, my background, uh, as you said, is in, uh, uh, well, my specialty is in uh, being a professional land surveyor and GIS specialist, and I sort of contract myself out for different universities and UNESCO and all kinds of things and it's taking me all over the world. This is one example of a large archaeological base map of the site in, uh, called Abydos in Egypt. It's the, the birthplace of all the first kings of Egypt before they eventually got buried in Saqqara and uh, Giza. Just to show you an example, this is 35 square kilometers of archaeological material over uh, thousands of years. This is the largest standing mud brick architecture on earth and this is one it's kind of the things I, I do. Anyway. Uh, now I work for Keep Wells Tidy as their GIS officer, and uh, we have now sort of embarked upon a kind of new thing, which is cultural heritage, and this is kind of where uh, my skills can hopefully be brought to bear. Uh, these are some of the things that Keep Wells Tidy does. So we organize, uh, we help organize community groups and uh, do all kinds of activities from eco-schools to uh, manage different schemes like the Blue Flag Beach Awards and Green Flag Awards in addition to litter picks and litter cleanups and all kinds of things that you may be aware of uh, that Keep Britain Tidy does or, or Keep Scotland Beautiful, our sister organization. Uh, so we, we coordinate approximately with 20 to 30,000 individual volunteers and uh, groups um, for all kinds of things. So uh, how, how the project came about? Well, uh, several years ago in uh, the peninsula, uh, one of these community groups, well, two of these community groups wanted to clear up, just clear vegetation around two holy wells. And they, uh, that, here's an example of one of them, uh, sort of before and after. And it had a, an amazing and profound experience, uh, sort of effect on these volunteers. They were sort of transported to, to just sort of a different place. This is kind of another shot of the same thing. And it just needed simple maintenance, you know, clear the water, clear the vegetation, very simple thing to do. And so we, we quickly learned that you know, this isn't a new thing. I mean, people kind of in their various capacities and, and effort and energy kind of do their own thing. Here's another example in Brecon, Mine D well. Uh, this is a fantastic example of like a well uh, uh, superstructure that has a date stamp on it, on the masonry, which is awesome. It's like 1760 or something. Obviously the well is older. Uh, there is a hill up <laughs> the hill, uh, which, which has a massive Iron Age fort. This particular water source also goes all the way down to Brecon Cathedral, where there's another well, which then goes down to the river, uh, whose name I, I forget off on my head. There's another well right at the, the base of the river. So it's part of the same water source. So if you're interested in hydrogeology or whatever, it's fascinating to see like why, what is this water source and why is it constant? Um, it's, yeah, really interesting. So uh, we are an HLF funded project in development phase currently. Let's see what the, the more uh, boring bits maybe, but uh, we are going to submit a round two application in, in March of next year that I'll you know, be helping write, of course. And uh, it just has, the project has you know, a fantastic sort of um, uh, way to bring people together, we hope, you know, between the you know, uh, Welsh water and the different statutory bodies of CADU and NRW and all these kind of things, and um, sort of develop community groups and help them organize as well. Uh, there, again, this hasn't been, you know, this isn't a new thing. People kind of do this. Already, but there is risk of of the 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 knowledge and the know-how kind of literally dying out. Uh, most of the people interested in wells are are older. Uh, they they don't know how to organize themselves. Uh, the, the the wells themselves, even though CADU and, and different archaeological trusts did a survey in 2011 and 2012, um, no no action has been taken on a you know consistent and cohesive way to help preserve them. Um, that this, this chap here, Ian Taylor, Ian Taylor, he runs a sort of a website and it's more like a travel blog, but um, you know, he could literally be hit by a bus and then that's, that's done, you know. So essentially the person with the most knowledge in North Wales about Holy Wells is at extreme risk of, you know, well, so going away. This is a map showing 
uh, the scheduled or listed wells, uh, but that is not the totality of them. There are maybe upwards of 2,000 wells, and people are finding them all the time. Um, you know, the, the last catalog was done, done by Francis Jones in 1954. There is a book called Holy Wells in Wales. That is sort of the standard, you know, the baseline that we know of. Uh, lots of those have already been lost through just basic neglect. Um, and one example of that, that that could have occurred is in Cardiff, actually. Uh, it is the uh, sort of name given to the road around this oval structure here. Now you can see uh, this is Cardiff High School. Now, somebody in the, in the planning commission, or whatever, whatever it was called in at the time, in 1890 or 1900 or something, <coughs> just one person knew of this well in, in Cardiff and literally you know, had the road, uh, diverted the road around it. Otherwise, it was going to you know, totally bisect the entire thing. Um, this is what it looks like. There's sort of a, on the right side of the screen there, there's the, the, the well itself. It's just kind of a, a sunken pool uh, to the left part of the screen here is a, a kind of mound with a big tree on it. It's some kind of quote unquote tomb of, of St. Dennis or whoever it was. Uh, you know, now to my mind, uh, this is a fa fantastic example of, you know, th there's nothing there, but you could close off the road, have a food truck event, have outdoor theater, have, uh, you know, the school is right there. You could do all kinds of things. It's a fantastic, you know, uh, reach this quite posh area as well. The town, you can see the allotments on the left. You know, you can, it, it, to me, it, it, it should be built around events, not the architecture of the wells themselves, because most of the time there is no architecture to speak of. Um, so this is just sort of, uh, yeah. What we want to do is eventually create a new trust or a new sort of organization to help bring together all these interested parties in wells uh, and sort of redo Francis Jones' sort of big, big idea, which is to kind of have, have a catalog, have a kind of you know, repository for the, these ideas and what people want to do, and also train people up in lime mortar masonry, you know, redoing or sort of basic conservation principles, um, and have archaeological events, young archaeology clubs, all this kind of stuff. Um, let's skip by this real quickly. Uh, yeah, so in the past, again, there has been sort of this start and stop uh, cycle where people get highly motivated to do some work and around cultural heritage, that, that enthusiasm burns out, people move, uh, you know, retire, whatever. Uh, there is no handing off of the process, and that, that kind of has to stop, and that's kind of why we are, at Keep Us Tight, are kind of helping to, to put the, this HLF bid in to, to sort of stop, you know, the sort of fragmented cycle. Uh, again, you know, the, the knowledge is, is at risk of being lost, and these stories uh, in particular. Uh, here's an example of, of a sort of travel blog uh, website. Again, interesting, maybe not as done up well as, as possible. You know, you think about terms of branding, marketing. There's only, there's only so much text people want to read, you know what I mean? And if people go on and on and on, it's, it's a bit much. Here's uh, the Wellsprings Fellowship. Uh, this, this website still exists. They were very active for a long time. It's about uh, sort of giving Holy Wells conferences, usually based in South Wales. There's Professor uh, Maddie Gray or Madeline Gray. Who is sort of the, the one of the experts of which there are many, by the way. Um, but for all intents and purposes, this this group has imploded. Um, you know, it's uh, again people moved on. There's yeah, this is uh, another group in North Wales, Ian Taylor. This website is originally in Welsh, uh, so thanks to the wonders of Google Translate, I can look at it. But obviously, I can't read Welsh, and it's all in Welsh. Um, so. Yeah, there are some bad examples of conservation uh, that people do not want to see, obviously, where you know concrete caps on wells, sort of bad conservation types, complete sterilization of, of the monument um, that we're trying to avoid. And that's kind of, when you think about messaging, people have in their heads, oh, we're gonna come in and do this. Well, no, we're not. We're gonna you know, appropriately treat each well according to what the community wants. And you know, we're sort of engaging now in community consultation about sort of what they wanna see. Uh, but we do have some sort of top-down ideas as well about what uh, what to do. Here's an example in, in Brecon again of, of uh, a very active well. You can see the, the cluties, sort of rags dipped in the well, and these are uh, supposed to cure an ailment. So you wrap it around a broken wrist or something and then you dip it in the well water and you hang it up. And then as the water, or as the, the, the cludie uh, disintegrates, so does your ailment. And this is kind of, I'll get back to this in a minute, but about um, this medieval tradition of, of 
uh, disease and what medicine is. Now, this is my favorite example because um, this is in my by the physicians well. Ostensibly, the, the, the well with the best tradition, the best history, um, is in the worst location possible. <laughs> uh, it's in the middle of nowhere. There's a whole bunch of common land around it. You can see the forest and the reservoir. The land is technically owned by Natural Resources Wales, which is kind of the new version of Environment Wales or Environment Agency. Um, however, it's leased to Welsh water for you know a thousand years or something ridiculous. Uh, they do not want to have anything on the site. End of story. There's no interpretation going to be happening on the site. No markers, no plaques, no benches, nothing. So. Um, what do you do? And also, it's it's logged. <laughs> you know, this is this is one step away from one mistake happening where they're going to trench it up and it's going to be gone forever. And excuse me, um, it's just kind of a muddy pit. Um, you know, I I wouldn't go there, but it's kind of cool. But the story is that in medieval times, the physicians, well, medieval physicians would go to the site and pick herbs. That's why it's called a physician's well, because the, the herbs that were grown, or that exist there, that still exist there, are only available at that location. And so it was known for having a, sort of, a, being a stopping off point for, for yeah, physicians to, to come. Uh, and I'll get back to that again in a minute, sort of this tradition of, of herbs and, and planting and that kind of thing. Um, so, so, right, how do you, you know, in some things, how, some places, how do you interpret things or places you can't see. How do you sort of get that story across? How do you get the legend across of the saint or the, the tradition of the story? Uh, I'll skip by that real quick. Um, and then, of course, we have the, the always ever-present problem of competing narratives. Everybody has their own like scheme and plan and all this kind of stuff. And I think the way we need to go down is sort of like dark skies, uh, where, say, if you look at Brecon Beacons National Park, there, there are groups of of people interested in, in astronomy and dark skies events. However, the, the Brecon Park itself can help promote both themselves and dark skies uh, as a kind of thing to do at a different time of day. And uh, it, it's just another layer of their marketing that they can feed into, rather than having a completely standalone thing with its own you know, interpretation plan. You know, people just get kind of all planned out, honestly. Uh, I think that's kind of not where we need to go. Um, and some, some ideas, which I'm just going to uh, go over real quick. Uh, sort of focus on sort of odd, maybe perhaps ideas that can help us do this. Um, because, you know, we just need to reinterpret uh, what's being done and make sure it doesn't, the, 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 the well story doesn't get lost again. I mean, why do they keep remaking Ben-Hur? You know, what, what is the need there to remake Ben-Hur over and over and over again? Like, did some, did some people really need to hear the story again? I mean, uh, and how do we make it relevant to, most importantly, young people? Because again, the crowd, that knows the most is literally dying out, and we need to make, you know, it's not about sort of appreciating architecture, it's about making events where young people will remember going there and doing something of, of worth, and if that's a food truck event or anything else, then, you know, that's one idea. Uh, this is from Kentucky. Uh, it's a comic book called Battle Pope. Uh, it's imagining the Pope as a uh, sort of crime fighter, demon fighter. You can tell Jesus is a sidekick. And if you can't tell, he has a shirt saying, what would I do? Uh, you know, and he's dressed as a hippie. Um, it's really, really kind of funny. However, it's terribly irreverent, uh, as you can see with, you know, uh, Mary. <laughs> um, now, to, to the people more on the religious persuasion, this is deeply offensive. And I, you know, I gave a talk similar to this in Ireland, and they were like, oh, no, you can't do that. But that's how you sort of engage another group of people. You know, some people want to read comic books or are more artistically inclined. Some people want to draw and reimagine the, the lives of saints in a, in a new and interesting way, frankly. And this, this is just funny to me, but, you know. Um, <laughs> and, you know, leads into sort of re redoing things that you probably see every day, you know, uh, revisionist travel posters or, you know, the, Things to do. There are some examples of this in, in Pembrokeshire where uh, they've, they've done this for a couple wells. Uh, geocaching. Uh, I, I love apps, however, my phone is usually full of photographs, not apps, so I can never install a new one. Uh, this is a perennial problem, I think, for a lot of people. Uh, I think a, a new app is not the way unless it's built around an, acti an activity that people can download. It's also linked to the same content on a website. But what I think you can do with apps is just hijacking an existing community that already exists. And one of them is geocaching. 
Uh, this is St. David's. Uh, I'm just going to skip by this real quick. There are literally thousands and thousands of geocaches, and if you don't know what they are, they're sort of um, things that people can do where you just take a GPS unit and you try and find this, these, these places here, and usually there's a small box with something in it um, that is maintained by a person or a group. And these can be you know, little, little cards, little trinkets, uh, but you can use this as a way perhaps to kind of hijack it, uh, interpretation. So there's no reason to say you can't work with the National Park and make a new geocache that in the geocache near a well, you have uh, uh, an audio cue or you have a tape recording or you have oral history inside the, the box, the story of the legend of the well. You know, you, you can really kind of think about innovative things uh, to sort of change it up. And it's a whole community that, that does this on the weekends. You know, they have no, it's just another way of getting, getting out into the landscape um, and, and having, you know, hopefully a good time. Uh, this is Glasgow here. You can see there's a lot around. Again, there are, th this has been going on since, uh, for, for decades now, this whole community. Uh, I'm a big, big <coughs> proponent of this. There's also innovative things you can do with geocaching, like you can see the locket here. Sometimes you have to find the location first and then they'll give you clues to find something else. And you can see the locket there at the lock. That's awesome. Like you can think about, you could draw a person's face or you can draw a dragon or you could draw you know, a, a well house, uh, something in the landscape. And it's like, it, you know, it, again, you can have fun with the interpretation, thinking with like the Nazca lines, you know, you can virtually draw in the landscape a new, uh, a new thing. Uh, there are some of the sort of other odd ideas like Neptune's Army, which is a group that people study to have found to help clean up litter in the marine environment. Of course, as we all know, this is all linked. Uh, water is, of course, a fundamental thing about wells. It's, you know, inherently linked to the water cycle and litter and rubbish and everything that we do. Uh, there's no reason to say we can't organize uh, what Neptune's Army does, but have, maybe have them start or stop at a well and then have a coordinated event with the church. You know, it's all about sort of combining community groups and these different uh, peoples. Uh, light painting is another example of sort of using the space differently at a different time. Uh, this is where you just take a flashlight or a torch or a sparkler and kind of have a long exposure phot photograph um, and just making interesting things. And again, it's a new community uh, going out and just using the space and sort of making something new. And you know, you can sell photographs, you can sell the experience, you can learn about photography or uh, astrophotography. If anybody went to the, uh, the Virgin Money sort of thing in Edinburgh a couple years ago, uh, this is, again is another example of virtually creating or you know recreating a cathedral on the high street, but having sound and music and all this is light. Uh, but I really want to talk about medieval medicine. Uh, I think the way to go is to build an activity <coughs> around medieval medicine, uh, focusing on the water itself. So. People, you know, like to sample things and, in the Enlightenment way, categorize things and put things in little vials. And uh, this is an example of urine. Uh, you used to be able to test um, test how well you were by by the color of your pee. <laughs> uh, there's no reason you can't have a whole thing like this of well water from all across Wales and, do, and then do interesting things with that, and then link it to medieval medicine. And I think a, an interesting activity would be to to have the starting point as a journey for children or secondary school uh, students, not you don't need to throw the history of the well at them themselves because they're just like cathedrals or, or castles. You get burnt out really quickly. However, if you just imagine this journey as you start off as an entirely diseased medieval person, um, and you have a kind of figure like this from some old manuscript, and you think, ah, oh, my God, my eyes really hurt, and some wells were known to have curative properties for curing that eye ailment or a rheumatoid arthritis or whatever ails you, uh, then you, the journey will be you have to find the wells or the saints that supposedly helped fix that problem. And then you, know, you get a score. So you will travel around Wales and other parts of the UK potentially. Uh, you will learn about the, the journey of the saints and the story. And you sort of you know, think of it in another, in another way. Uh, and then this gets into uh, medieval medicine and, and herbs again, if just remember um, Physicians well. Uh, I think there's there's something to be done here with. You don't have to put a placard up. You can you can have a little herb garden. You can have a community grow a kind of physic garden where they take herbs and then have it in a local community because, or it's part of an already existing park. Uh, it would be very easy, I think, to kind of engage with uh, park people and 
and just have a small plot of land that somebody maintains and you know link to a well off site. Um, the last example I want to give here is Bardsey Island, uh, sort of in the same theme of vegetation. This was known as a big pilgrimage site in medieval times. It had a sort of mon monastery and a whole monastic complex, and there were hundreds of monks and everything. Um, <clears throat> there are wells on the island. None of them are named after anybody. Um, but the, the interesting thing was a few years ago, the, an apple tree was found growing on the side of this house. You can literally see it clinging for life in the salt spray to this house. It's sort of being all wind and ocean blasted. Uh, it, it, it is the only surviving, or was at the time, the only surviving example of the, the now Bardsey apple, uh, which was originally grown by the monks in a giant orchard, and that's the last surviving tree. And it's you know, about six, hundred, six or 700 years old. Um, this was, of course, cut and replanted. You can now buy them online. But I, but I thought, or I think anyway, that what is, this is the perfect example you can, you can use as a marker of where wells are. You know, plant a tree. Um, so that, that always becomes a symbol. If you know it's there, then there must be a well nearby, because there's always a strong tradition of, of uh, majestic trees growing over wells or near wells, and that, that's all part of the, the ambiance of um, the, the experience, shall we say. Uh, so, I, and in terms of like promoting Welsh heritage and culture, you know, I think this is an iconic thing that we can do if communities want to kind of go down that road, it's just sort of showing what can be done. Uh, and I sort of liken it to film, you know, once the, once the film is lost, or uh, the, the, the story is lost as well, and, and that's kind of the, the whole uh, point of preserving. So, thank you very much.